um, to carry on now with two um, more presentations. The first by Ellen Swift, Material Culture, a Design Perspective. Thanks, Ella. Thanks very much for inviting me to speak today. And I have to say I'm very relieved that I've got more than five minutes to uh, <laughs> present my paper in. So I think all our speakers just now did a fantastic job packing that information in. Okay, so what I want to talk to you about today is a project that I've been doing on the design and function of everyday Roman artefacts. And this project was very kindly supported by the Leverhulme Trust. And I'm also very grateful to a lot of museums around Britain, which I visited during the course of this project to study their collections. So a lot of the material that I'm drawing on is Romano-British material, although the project takes a kind of wider perspective on artefacts. Okay, so these are the particular areas that I've been interested in exploring. So I've been thinking about a return to considering questions of function. So I got very interested in things like the relationship between the design of objects and their actual use, and then also how the design and production of objects relates to things like social behaviour, how design, how production questions relate to human relationships with objects. <coughs> Um, I'm also interested in user groups, so what assumptions are embodied in objects about intended users, and that's something that's quite interesting to explore. So what are the theoretical perspectives that I've been using? Well, I've been drawing on um, design theory, so these are some of the key authors that have been important to the approach that I've been taken, taking. <clears throat> So, uh, in particular, I'm using the concept of affordances, which is the idea that artefacts have perceived properties that incline people towards certain uh, uses. <clears throat> so, this can be very simple. So, if you think about a chair, for instance, it has a flat surface. Hopefully, it has a padded surface. These things afford sitting. So, the chair is designed uh, to foster a certain kind of use. And, of course, this may sound a bit familiar to you, because it sounds a lot like the form-function relationship in archaeology. So that's something that's been um, well established in archaeological studies. I think where the concept of affordances uh, differs from previous form-function considerations is that the idea of affordances allows for discrepant uses of artefacts as well. So artefacts are designed for particular purposes, but they also have features which can then be used for purposes which were not originally intended. So to give an example, a chair is heavy and you can use it to prop open a door. So it affords being used as a door prop, even though it wasn't originally made for that purpose. So that brings me on to my uh, second theoretical perspective. I've drawn quite heavily on Beth Preston's work. She's a philosopher of material culture, and she's particularly interested in exploring the relationship between design intentions and then actual uses of objects. <clears throat> and then the third um, theoretical perspective that I've been using is this idea of design assumptions. So this really draws on studies of modern material culture, which look at the way that um, <clears throat> artefacts have encoded information, if you like, which are based on design assumptions. <clears throat> so what do makers tend to assume about users? And then what does this reveal about wider society? So very often, makers assume that users are going to be able-bodied, they assume that users will be right-handed, and they assume that users will be adults. <clears throat> so we can see that artefact design isn't neutral. It's aimed at certain categories of users, whether that's a conscious thing or not. So it's possible then to look at artefacts and to try and explore who is included or excluded by the design of an artefact and then what this reveals about wider society. <clears throat> okay, so in this paper today, what I want to do is just to give some brief examples of the types of objects that I've been using to explore various different questions relating to artefact design. And then I want to move on to a more detailed case study where I'll look at the design features of finger rings in relation to the motifs that are depicted uh, on them. So firstly then, just an overview of some of the types of objects that I've been looking at and the questions that I've been considering. Obviously, design and function is a complicated topic, and there's been a lot of critiques of 
functional studies and we have to take those into account. So we can't just take for granted the form-function relationship. We have to interrogate that relationship in various ways. So people don't always use objects for the purpose that they were designed for. And sometimes functional features of objects become obsolete but are still present in an artefact design. And I think the classic example of this now is car keys. It's not quite obsolete because if your battery fails, you can still stick that bit of the key into the, the lock and open the, the, the car physically. But mostly we open our cars using the button and we don't use the, the sort of physical part of the, the object. <coughs> so um, function can be quite a, a difficult question to, to address. <coughs> So we can, what we can do is look at other sources of evidence and try and interrogate functional features by comparing them with other evidence. And I've done this in various different ways. So one of the things that we can do is to look at the use where on the objects, because if we look at the where, then we can begin to evaluate whether those objects were used for the purpose for which they were designed or whether they were used in different ways. So to what extent did discrepant uses exist? Can we identify when functional features of artefacts become obsolete and when they don't. <clears throat> so some of you may have heard me speak about spoons um, in this, uh, on this topic before. Uh, another area that I've looked at is looking at key finger rings. So these are uh, finger rings which have a key bit on them. So the idea is that you could then use that finger ring as a key. And some people have questioned the idea that these were functional artefacts. So particularly for the very... Uh, elaborate examples, it's been suggested that perhaps these had become purely decorative objects and they were no longer used as keys. But if we look at the wear marks on these artefacts, we can see quite clearly there's a consistent wear pattern um, where they, ha they have sort of wear down one side of them, I don't know if you can see it on the slide, but this one it has wear down this side. And that's a very consistent pattern within these key fingering. So we can show that although this looks like a very decorative object, actually that functional feature has been uh, maintained. So that's one way that we can try and test out um, functional perspectives, if you like. Another thing that we can do is to look at deposition context. And of course, we're kind of well used to this in a way because there have been quite a lot of work on contextual studies which look at discrepant uses of artefacts by context. Um, but my particular objects that I looked at from this perspective were shears, so a very neglected category of material. And, you know, we saw what fantastic work Owen is doing with tools, and I really urge people to take up this topic of tools because there's so much that can be done looking at practical tools. Anyway, I looked at shears and then evaluated the functional appearance of those shears against the um, deposition context, which were in, as, with assemblages of equipment. So you could try and uh, make some kind of correlation between what the shears look like and the assemblages of tools that they are uh, buried with. <coughs> And then the third way that I tried to evaluate uh, functional aspects of artefacts is to look at artefacts in relation to the end products that these artefacts were used to create. So for this um, particular part of it, I looked at ink pens and manuscripts because we have surviving manuscripts, we have surviving ink pens, why don't we bring the two together and actually look at what effect the form of the pen has on the manuscript that's been created. And it's quite interesting because you can see that um, script styles develop and change, and of course those changes turn out to be related to changes in what the nib looks like for ink pens. <clears throat> okay, so that's some questions just trying to evaluate function and tr trying to um, assess function by looking at comparative uh, evidence. <clears throat> now once you've got as far as being able to establish a normative functional use for your objects, then we can go on to think about some other topics. So I've also been very interested in questions of behaviour and experience. Um, so I've looked at things like Roman dice, and of course these dice have very particular properties that will affect the kinds of games that you can have with them, the kinds of experiences you can have. So to give an example here, you can see this, this nice die from, the, from London, <coughs> in the Museum of London Collection has very rounded corners, so when you throw that dice, it's going to roll around on the table a lot before it comes to rest. So that is then going to affect how the user's dice game uh, experience uh, is enjoyed. So are you going to feel apprehensive watching that dice roll around on the table? Are you going to get bored waiting for it to come and settle down? Do you have time to say a quick prayer if this is a ritual 
um, experience. So I've been trying to kind of link together the functional features of artefacts with things like uh, emotion, behaviour and experience. <clears throat> um, I'm also quite interested in production and how production affects human relationships with objects. Because certain aspects of production uh, can be studied in this way to, and it's quite revealing. So one of the things that I've looked at in this regard was a mould-made glass bottles. So these are blown, but they're blown into a mould. And of course, as soon as you start using a mould, then that offers the possibility of standardisation. It offers the possibility of set sizes and quantification. So these are all things that are made possible by that particular production method. So that proved to be quite an interesting um, <coughs> area to investigate. Now, the area that I want to focus on in a bit more detail today, just to give you a more detailed um, case study example of what I've been doing, is looking at design and user groups. So what does the design uh, of objects tell us about the people who were intended to be the users of those objects? And of course, those objects will then have a long biography after that and may go on to be used in numerous different ways by numerous different users. But I'm very interested in the initial stage. How is the object designed to be used? and what were its uses according to that original intention. <clears throat> so I've been looking at the motifs on finger rings in relation to gender and age categories. And of course there's a lot of data on finger rings out there, it's fantastic. So I got data from more than a thousand uh, finger rings. And this is mostly from the northwestern provinces. Uh, there's, there is quite a bit of material from uh, Britain, but also a lot of material from Roman Germany, and of course a lot of material where we don't have a provenance um, as well. And I think this just reflects artefact studies more widely. We don't look at only Britain. We always tend to look, try and look at assemblages across different provinces, and I think that's a point Helen made this morning, that we have to try and integrate uh, <coughs> Romano-British objects into the wider picture. Right, okay, so the, the, the interesting thing about fingerings and certain types of um, jewellery is that they are scaled to body sizes, so that's quite uh, useful for archaeological purposes. So children need a different diameter of fingering um, to adults, and women tend to have a different diameter of fingering to men, although, of course, there will be some overlap in the middle. So if we can divide fingerings into appropriate diameter sizes, then we can start to think about the relationship between the motifs on the finger rings and the intended users of the rings. So were some particular motifs chosen especially for children, for instance, or were some specific motifs designed to be used especially by uh, women or by men? <coughs> Now, before we get into the details of the data, we need to think about the Roman life course in a bit more detail and um, age and gender identities as they were conceived in the Roman period. And there have been quite a few recent studies of the Roman life course, for instance, Harlow and Lawrence there, and that the, <clears throat> the Roman life course and age-related identities do define social roles and activities in the Roman period. And age and gender identity are um, interrelated and linked to other important statuses such as uh, marriage status. And if we look at written texts from Rome, then we can get information about different life stages and how they were defined. So children, for instance, were uh, defined or categorised in two separate life stages, babies and very young children first, and then secondly, older children. And these kinds of definitions were important in legal contracts for <coughs> related to betrothal and marriage. And then adulthood is reached at about age 17 uh, for boys, and marriage for girls happens normally in the late teens, <coughs> although sometimes betrothal is uh, earlier than that. So that's the, the kind of preamble in terms of uh, the, the Roman understanding of the life course. Now, how does this map onto our data? So, what we need to do with the fingerings is firstly to find out what diameter sizes belong to different uh, <coughs> life course stages. And of course, since anthropologists haven't collected the data for us according to Roman life course stages, um, <coughs> so we have to sort of look at this in a bit more of a basic way. But what we can do is look at burial evidence and have a look at the diameters of fingerings that are occurring in 
burials that have been checked and aged through business anthropology. Uh, <clears throat> so we can divide into three broad categories here, uh, children's graves, adult females, and adult ma males. And if we look at the span of diameter sizes, we can see that there is overlap in the middle. So you can see that these middle range uh, diameters are <clears throat> found in children's graves and in adult men and women's graves. But there are also some noticeable trends in the data. So we can see that children's rings are peaking at this diameter about 14 with a loss in the 15 millimetres. And then adult female rings with a very strong peak at 17 millimetres. This is all inner diameter data. <clears throat> I couldn't find as much data for adult males buried with rings, but we can see that the diameter sizes do extend uh, towards the, the larger end of the range. <clears throat> Of course, the other thing we need to think about is what finger are you wearing your ring on because that's going to affect the size as well. So in order to tackle that question, I looked at a lot of evidence from visual sources. So um, sculptural reliefs, statues and mummy portraits and drawing together all of that evidence, I was able to establish that rings are normally worn on the smaller fingers. Uh, that's a, a sort of norm that we can uh, refer to. And obviously I don't have time to present all that uh, evidence. Okay, so if we've got an idea of which finger ring diameters belong to which life course stages, then we can start to see then how that is reflected in the data that I've gathered. So this data is compiled from mostly published fingering catalogues, and it has to be catalogues that actually gave me the measured inner diameter. And it's frustrating because there's quite a lot of catalogues or site reports that don't give you the inner diameter. And it's funny because you can see that these, early, these very early catalogues like Marshall, they are thinking of it more from an antiquarian's perspective and a collector's perspective, and from the perspective of people who might actually wear the ring, so they give you the inner diameter. But then when we get to more archaeological approaches, much more modern and recently published data, then we tend to find external diameters are published instead because that idea of someone wearing the ring, we sort of forgot about that on the way somewhere. <laughs> anyway, that's just a little bright. <laughs> so, this is my overall distribution. So this is all of the thousand rings, and it has a sort of normal distribution, which is kind of what we would expect. But we do see some peaks in the distribution, so we do seem to have some most common sizes for children and for adults, women and for men. <laughs> so children peaking at around 15, and then adult women at 17, which is same as the burial data, and then men it seems to be sort of 20 millimetres. Obviously these are inferences uh, as to what may have caused these, these peaks. <coughs> so then if we start to look at individual motifs, what do we find? So, I mean, this is the first one I looked at, and of course I looked at this one. In fact, when I was evaluating whether this was going to be worth doing, this was one of the first motifs I looked at, because already in, in some catalogues, Scholars have noticed that these phallus rings occur in very small sizes. So I thought, well, this is a good one to start. What would this, does this bear out? If I collect the data and do a detailed study, will we find that this kind of bias to, to tiny sizes with rings that show a phallus on them? And indeed, it proved to be the case. <coughs> so just to explain the graphs for you, I don't know how well you can see them at the back there, but my graphs all show the, the distribution of the, all of the data, so the overall pattern in grey, so that's the same as the previous slide that I showed you. So that's the, the overall distribution. And then in the black, you can see the distribution of the rings with the motif that I'm particularly interested in. So the black bars here show the phallus rings, and we can see that they cluster at the extreme end of the distribution. So the, the biggest peak is 11 millimetres there for the diameter. So just think about how tiny that is as a, a diameter. <coughs> So that, that seems to be a very strong sort of trend in the data. And of course, it does correlate with some other evidence that we have from Roman Britain. So we sometimes find phallus pendants and jewellery with phallus motifs in the graves of very young children. So here's an example from the Colchester uh, Butch Road uh, Cemetery. <coughs> so um, one can also bring into play the other um, features that the rings have. So I do <coughs> some weight because we have some weight data recorded for things like the early British Museum catalogue. And we can see that these rings are also very light in weight. So all of the examples with weight recorded weighed less than 1.5 grams. So I think this data patterning then maps onto the infant stage 
of the Roman life course. So it seems that these life course stages do have some reality in material culture terms. They have some reality outside of legal text in Rome, and that's quite interesting um, thing to be able to establish. Now, I hope you're not going to get too sick of graphs because I have got a few more, um, but I try to keep it, you know, not too many. <coughs> so, are there any other motifs that are associated with the, the lower end of the diameter range? Well, um, palm branch motif was one, so that was a bit of a surprise to me. Uh, the palm branch is most often associated with uh, victory or with Christianity, um, neither of which seems kind of obviously sort of time related. But of course, people have also noted that the palm branch um, was also thought to be a protective design and protective against the evil eye. So I think it's in that manifestation that we're seeing it here. And we can see that palm branch doesn't have the same distribution as the phallus ring, so they're not so skewed towards the extreme small sizes, but they are still peaking in children's sizes, 14, 15 uh, millimetres. So this seems to be a motif that's particularly associated with children um, <clears throat> at the point when the ring was was designed and probably the initial uses of that ring. <coughs> and then another one which seems to be a children's ring motif, this one is um, corn ears, so corn ears associated with prosperity, so again that's a kind of lucky or protective motif that one might think was suitable to give um, to a child. <coughs> okay, so considering the motifs that we've looked at so far, we can see that stages of childhood do seem to be embodied through material culture. They have some um, validity, and they also have some validity in provincial society. But of course, we have to remember that we're only looking at a sort of subset of people who had the greatest exposure to Roman style culture. These rings are very Roman style objects, a lot of them are intaglio rings. So, so this is a, a sort of small subset of society that we're, we're looking at here. So, um, can we find any evidence relating to? Um, other groups within society, well, there is this distribution which crops up quite a lot of the finger rings. So it's um, so again, the grey bars is the overall averages, and then the black bars show this particular motif. So in this case, we're looking at Hercules motif, and we can see that there is a strange dip in the middle of the distribution. So at the very sizes, which are the most common in the data overall, we get a dip uh, in this particular motif. <coughs> And then we have a skew towards the larger end of the size ranges. And that's not a one-off pattern. That pattern comes up repeatedly. And it's a pattern that was also noticed by Ferger in his analysis of fingering from Oust. So he looked at Oust and he suggested that some of the types of rings from the site of Oust related to whereby uh, men, he thought this was a masculine distribution. <coughs> so what kinds of motifs are showing this, this distribution? Uh, well, the most extreme uh, examples of this are uh, Jupiter and Emperor motifs. <coughs> so these Jupiter and Emperor motifs show the biggest skews to the, the largest um, diameter sizes. So we've got none at all very small sizes. We've got a few in these sizes which are associated perhaps with children. And then we've got a complete absence in the women's, adult women's sizes. And then a big uh, peak towards this end of the graph. So most of these Jupiter and Emperor motifs occurring very, very large sizes indeed. And that seems quite telling, doesn't it, really, because, of course, um, Jupiter and the Emperor, these motifs have connotations with symbols of absolute power, sector and divine uh, power. <coughs> so here's the overall um, list of the, the fingering motifs that seem to be showing up in masculine diameter sizes, if that's how we can interpret them. So we have things like Jupiter, Emperor and Hercules, also things like eagle, lion, mercury, and then rings with an inscription, Fidem Constantino. <coughs> and of course we can evaluate how likely it is that these really are masculine distributions by looking at some associated evidence. So of course many of these motifs have masculine and military associations. So the lion, for instance, is a masculine symbol in uh, Roman astrology. Now there's lots of other interesting correspondences actually between fingering motifs and astrological symbols that relate to developing age and gender identity, but I don't really have time to go into all of that, uh, unfortunately, but that, that does seem to be quite an interesting feature of the data that I've been looking at. <coughs>
We can also look at site type distribution, which we were talking about earlier on today. So, of course, these studies were, Hennig was among the first to do this kind of site type study, and he looked at fingering motifs that come up at different site types. And certainly some of these uh, motifs, Jupiter, Eagle and the Lion, these are very strongly represented at early military sites. <coughs> and if you want a contrasting picture, then uh, Bonus Eventus does not appear at military sites according to Hennig, and it's also one of the rings that doesn't have a masculine distribution of diameter sizes. <coughs> um, and these FIDEM rings, of course, we think that these were given to men in imperial service, so again, there's clear additional evidence that these are likely to have had uh, masculine connotations. <coughs> okay, so how does this all relate to Roman Britain, I hear you say. Um, so again, a lot of the data I looked at is from Britain, but we can use this kind of data, or these kinds of channels, to explore particular Romano-British sites. So we can look at votive deposits because these often include large numbers of finger rings. So um, here's the site at Great Walsingham. This is the assemblage uh, published by Bagwell Smith in Britannia, I believe. And um, we can see the assemblage is clearly a votive assemblage with finger rings of mercury, inscribed objects um, <coughs> dedicated to mercury and other gods. And it also has a little assemblage of finger rings. So I think there's 12 fingerings altogether at this site. Some of them have motifs of mercury. And these show a masculine range of diameter sizes. And it's always important to look at the overall range of diameters um, if you can, because obviously if you focus in on one particular ring, it may be the exception to the rule. But these rings do seem to have a masculine range of diameter sizes. And it's the same at Sector. If we look at that site, there are 22 rings in that assemblage. We think that's a votive assemblage as well. It's dedicated to fauna. And we can see also that that assemblage has a masculine range of diameter sizes. <coughs> okay, so how can we interpret all of this fingering data? Um, well, I hope to show that fingering motifs were designed for particular social categories. They help to constitute identity groups um, through material culture. <coughs> And we can see, for instance, stages of childhood being embodied um, through material culture. This isn't necessarily a straightforward relationship, though. Um, there's an indirect relationship in this case of the children's motifs. The motifs themselves don't directly symbolise childhood. They are protective motifs, and children are felt to need particular protection. So that's why these motifs are given particularly to children, and then, of course, may have become associated with, with children. <coughs> So it's a more indirect relationship than just a motif that is like a kind of badge of identity, if you will. Um, I hope I've also been able to establish that there's a particular range of masculine motifs and that these motifs often do have um, military associations. And we can use this kind of um, <coughs> correlation to explore things like gendered behaviour at shrines. So is depositing fingerings at shrines a particularly masculine thing to do? Is it something that we find at shrines dedicated to male gods. There's all sorts of questions there that we can start to explore in relation to gendered behaviour at shrines. And people have started to do this by looking at feminine jewellery at shrines, so Joanna Bird has, has looked at this a bit. Um, <clears throat> but now we can fill in the masculine side of the picture, uh, perhaps by investigating this at the range of voters' uh, sites. <clears throat> and of course, um, we can use this kind of data to try and evaluate the spread in the provinces of cultural norms that are documented for Rome. So in provinces where we have little textual evidence, we can try and use artifact evidence um, to, to see whether particular cultural trends are present in those regions. <coughs> so let's think about um, rounding up then. So I hope to have shown that studying the design features of artifacts allows us to explore everyday function, behaviour and experience. And we can illuminate how social practices and cultural conventions were enacted or contested through everyday objects. <clears throat> and to come back to a perennial question of interest to, to Roman scholars, it, it's also a good category of material that's quite underexploited that allows us to examine that hoary old question of the influence of Roman culture on wider provincial society, or indeed the resistance to uh, Roman culture that we find in the provinces. So I hope very much that these kinds of approaches to artifacts will be useful to people in future studies of material from Roman Britain. Uh, if you're interested in reading more, uh, my book's just out from Oxford University Press, and there's a flyer at the back which gives you a discount on the 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Can people hear me? Do, do you think the rings were created for the wearers, or are there signs that they were handed down from generation to generation, particularly having regard to modifications that might have been made to them? Yes, I think, well, I think both things are true, aren't they? So I think particularly at the very highest levels of society, people would be able to commission an, an individual ring for their own personal use, so they would have a very large input into the design that was chosen, and then maybe sort of a less affluent levels of society, you might have to choose from a range of figurines that were available to you. But we do know from text and from archaeological evidence that yes, rings were passed down as heirlooms, so we do find them burial sometimes, but, and they're much earlier than the date of burial, so from that evidence we can see that heirlooms also existed. Yeah. And, and in examining them, have you seen them modified as such? Um, I think sometimes they are recut, sometimes the motif is recut, but I can't think of too many specific examples. Mm. One more. Uh, leading on from the earlier question, presumably many of the rings that were handed down were signet rings. Yeah. Now, is there a correlation between rings, which are obviously signet rings, and masculine dimensions, and, and female ones? Are there, na uh, are there fewer female sized rings, which are signet rings? Um, you get signet rings occur in both masculine and feminine sizes, where you do see a bit of a distinction is the children's rings. So it's not until children are a bit older that they start to be given these signet rings. The very small rings tend to have designs in relief. So like the phallus ring, which has the, the phallus design projecting from the surface that can't be used as a signet ring. And then when children get slightly older, they start to be given signet rings that they can use. But yes, certainly women are using them very much. Yeah, I just missed your explanation of why the results for the Hercules ring were skewed. Who was wearing that men? Yeah, so that's the masculine dynasty size. So <coughs> As we would expect. Okay. Distribution. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much.